All right. So today we're going to, um, last time we talked about the momentum principle, which is our first real fundamental principle. And I kind of think yellow chalk has better contrast. Do you like yellow chalk better or yellow chalk is better? Yeah. Do you like any red? The red is kind of dark. I, uh, it's not good for <coughs> everyday writing. <laughs> so, <coughs> remember that one way we wrote it is that the momentum is short of an object, a system, a short time in the future <coughs> depends on two different things. It depends on its <laughs> momentum right this minute, right this instant, and it depends on the net force that acts on it due to objects in the surroundings times delta t, the length of the time interval over which the force <coughs> acts. And so this is a very important principle. It tells us how we can calculate quantitatively how a force is going to change the momentum of an object and therefore change its trajectory, its whole behavior. <coughs> and there's not that much to it. A lot of what we're going to end up worrying about is how to calculate the forces. <coughs> because sometimes it's not that obvious. Once we know the momentum of an object, we can make, we can uh, get an approximate value for the, the average velocity of that object. And the approximation we're going to use in most of our, our work is that we're going to be taking very small time intervals, delta t, small enough that the net force on this object doesn't change significantly during that interval. And we're going to use the final momentum over the mass as an approximation to the average velocity. And at that point, we have a way to predict motion forever, open-endedly into the future. Because we can just keep doing this and keep, and then we have Okay, stop that. Obviously set that wrong. Let's try again. Uh, 12 over 5. This is an alarm that reminds me that we have a quiz. So, <laughs> um, <coughs> so then we can do our final is our initial plus <coughs> the average delta t. So basically our scheme is gonna look like this. We find the net force on an object. <coughs> we update the momentum using the momentum principle. <coughs> we update the position. Our final is our initial plus and now we just do it again and we can just keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it until we get the result we want so we're going to call this iterative prediction 
So what does iterate mean? It just means to do the same thing, keep repeating the same thing again and again and again. <coughs> and so that's <coughs> a lot of what we're going to be doing. <coughs> what did I do with that yellow chalk I had? Oh well. <coughs> so, so there's a question though. <coughs> Why are we using the average is approximately the momentum at the end of this time interval? <coughs> Why not? arithmetic average, which would be add the momentum at the beginning, add the momentum at the end, divide by two, <coughs> and then <coughs> divide that whole thing by the mass. <coughs> and the real answer is that for most situations, this actually works a lot better. There's one, so most situations, there's one situation <coughs> where this is good, and that's if the momentum is changing linearly with time, and that happens if the force is constant. So if we have <coughs> say this is, let's plot the x component here of velocity as a function of time, the x component of momentum is a function of time. <coughs> uh, we have T initial, T final, V X initial, <coughs> V X final. <coughs> and you can see that the, the average velocity, the, the, the arithmetic average, which would be in the middle, is actually going to be right. <coughs> because the velocity is actually not changing. <coughs> Where we get into trouble is when that's not the case. <coughs> and if the force acting on something isn't a constant force, then the momentum isn't going to change linearly necessarily. So for example, <coughs> suppose we had <coughs> a situation <coughs> with time where we have <coughs> V sub, let's call it V sub Y versus time, doing something like this. <coughs> then suppose we said, well, here's our initial time, and here's our final time. And so this is our initial y component of velocity, and here's our <coughs> final y component of velocity. <coughs> so we take the arithmetic average of, of these two things, it's going to give us <coughs> this number as is is an average. Now the real average is probably more like something down there. <coughs> so, so this, this arithmetic average is, is very often not a particularly good approximation. <coughs> Whereas if we just <coughs> take the approach of taking a small time interval and taking the momentum after we've updated, we actually get very good predictions of motion. <coughs> so let's try an example. So <coughs> So you probably know from previous science courses that near the Earth's surface, the force that the Earth exerts on some object in the so the y component. 
is equal or approximately equal really to the product of the mass of the object times a constant called little g and little g has the value of 9.8 newtons per <coughs> kilogram. <coughs> so you've seen this before? You've seen this before. <coughs> we'll see where this comes from in chapter 3. It's not a magic number. We can actually predict this. <coughs> so we'll see where that comes from. But for now we'll just use it. <coughs> so that <coughs> if we had a force on a 10 kilogram mass near the Earth's surface, that would be 10 kilograms times zero. There's a 9.8 times so newtons per kilogram times 10 kilograms, zero newtons, and this is in the negative y direction. So g is a positive constant, but the, the force is in the negative y direction. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Which would give us, <coughs> oh, I didn't need to multiply twice by 10 kilograms, did I? <coughs> So that equals zero minus 98 zero newtons. <coughs> now on the moon, little g is different. Uh, it depends on the mass of the, the object. <coughs> so on the moon, <coughs> little g is about 1.6 newtons per kilogram and so we're gonna we're gonna do a problem where we talk about kicking a ball on the moon so we're gonna kick it up in the air and we're gonna think about predicting its trajectory why on the moon is there gonna be air resistance on the moon no no air right so um, no air no air resistance so we can actually predict reasonably accurately what would happen on the moon <coughs> So let's take a ball, so on the moon, we have a ball of mass, what did I pick here, I wanted the numbers to be really easy so we could just do this easily, 1.25 kilograms. <coughs> And we kick it with an initial speed, initial velocity, <coughs> of <coughs> um, yeah, 12 meters per second in the x direction, 12 meters per second in the y direction, and zero in the z direction. <coughs> and so we want to find out where it is after one second. <coughs> so what do we do? What's our plan for solving this problem? <coughs> that, right? Yeah, so that's our plan. <coughs> so let's let's do this. So the first thing we have to do is to calculate the force. Right? <coughs> so the force and the the net force on the ball at the, on the moon is just going to be the gravitational force. Um <coughs> So we'll just call it F G is equal to 1.25 kilograms, or actually we'll 
just do it this way, 0 in the negative y direction, 1.25 kilograms times 1.6 newtons per kilogram, 0, which is equal to 0 minus 2, 0 newtons, just to make our life simple. Okay, what's the initial momentum? So we need to update the momentum. We need the the initial momentum of the ball. What? Do, how do we calculate that? Okay, mass, mass times velocity. So the initial momentum of the ball is just 1.25 kilograms times its velocity, which is 12 12 zero meters per second, and that gives us an initial momentum of 15, 15, zero kilogram meters per second. Okay, now what's the next step? <coughs> Final momentum, right? Okay, final momentum. So we're going to use the momentum principle. P final is equal to our initial momentum. 15, 15, 0 <coughs> kilogram meters per second plus the force, which is 0 minus 2, 0 newtons times our time interval. Let's just take a one second time interval. It's probably a little long, but, but we'll say times <coughs> one second. <coughs> and so what does that come out to? <coughs> yep. So, so 15 plus 0 is 15, 15 plus a negative 2 times 1 is 13 kilogram meters per second. Okay, so now what do we do? You have to update the position, don't we? So our final is our initial and let's make our initial to <coughs> so our initial is negative 140 zero zero meters <coughs> relative to some origin or other <coughs> so we have a negative 140 zero zero meters plus what? <coughs> the final momentum divided by the mass, so it's 15, 3, 13, zero kilogram meters per second divided by uh, 1.25 kilograms <coughs> times our time interval, which is one second. <coughs> now it isn't always going to be one second. So it's not always going to be a one here and so... And we need the seconds to cancel out those seconds. <coughs> and so that comes out to... What does that come out to? <coughs> uh, We know 15 divided by 1.25 is 12 because that's how we got it in the first place. 10.40. Uh, this comes out to. Uh, 
12, 10.40 meters, and we have to add that to our initial position. <clears throat> so that should give us negative 138, uh, 10.40, 128, right, sorry. <coughs> meters. <coughs> so it moved in the x direction. Notice that um, this force didn't change the x component of its momentum. It only changed the y component. And then it also went, <coughs> went up, but it's, it's slowing down. <coughs> Okay, well, now we could do it again, and do it again, and do it again. And that's actually, we can do it by hand. It's a lot nicer to ask a computer to do it. So let's, let's look at a program that does this. <coughs> Okay, so let's blow it up so we can read it together here. So this is just a line that, this is the only fancy line. I'm moving the camera down a little bit so that we can see the trajectory better. But okay, I defined a variable m for mass 1.25 kilograms. I defined a variable g for little g, 1.6 newtons per kilogram. I made a ball. Um, <coughs> it's a sphere. Its location is the initial location. Its radius is 0 0.5. It's cyan colored and it's going to leave a trail. <coughs> Here's the initial velocity. That's a vector. <coughs> Now the momentum, the initial value of the momentum is mass times this initial velocity. So now this variable p is what we're going to be updating. And here's our gravitational force. That's equal to a vector 0, uh, negative 1.6, I probably should have said negative. That would have been a much better, much cleaner find G. Okay. And then I'm going to print these things just to see what they are. Now, in this particular case, it's okay for me to calculate the force once and then assume it's going to stay the same because this force is constant. The mass of the moon isn't changing. In a lot of situations that we model, that's not going to be the case. Um, even in gravitational situations, if we're modeling a spacecraft getting far away from the Earth, the gravitational force of the Earth is changing, and it depends on the distance. So in many situations, we would have to recalculate the force every time we did this momentum update. But this time, for constant force, it's okay just to calculate it once, because we're, we know it's constant. <coughs> And so we have a time, we're going to take a time step of one second, which is probably a little large. So here's where the action is. Let's see, we're not using that. So um, let's come back to this in a second. Here's, here's our update of momentum, right? So we have, remember that what the computer's doing is, here's this slot in memory labeled P. We're adding, a, taking the current value, adding something to it, and then taking this sum and storing it back in there. So that's why it says P equals P plus F net delta T because it means read up the old, the current value of P, add this quantity to it, and then store it back into that slot in memory labeled P. <coughs> And now, this is something you've been doing a lot of. We're just going to update the position of the ball. Take the current position, 
use this value of P we just calculated divided by the mass to approximate the average velocity and so this is our final is our initial plus F net plus average velocity times DT add one to DT and then just print time momentum position now why do I have this weird <coughs> so the ball is going to go up and come down right so I want it to be when it's above zero right the problem is if I put a zero in here the program doesn't run at all because it's already zero when it starts <laughs> so it says I shouldn't do anything so I have to make it a slightly different number. Um, <clears throat> so let's run this and see what we get. <clears throat> so okay, there we go. <clears throat> so <clears throat> our these are our initial values. We got the same thing for momentum and the same thing for the net force so we're good and now I'm just gonna step through it so here's our first step after one second the new momentum is 15 per second which is what we got the position of the ball is negative 128 10.40 meters which is what we got and so it's doing exactly the same calculation but now we can just keep doing it now it's going to use the new momentum to update it so now the momentum the y component of momentum is decreasing even more uh, the ball is going up and to the right and as we keep going we print out all these values <coughs> and we actually ended up here um, slightly the last step put us way below the surface because of this strange thing where we have an incredibly small negative number <coughs> basically that's zero but um, that number is is so small that it's still less than our test so we, we went one extra step but that's okay <coughs> so now we can answer some questions about this <coughs> fairly easily like how far did it go and how high did it so since we don't have that many numbers we can just scroll back and scroll up and down looking at the y values <coughs> it looks like it was at least 39 meters in the air which is pretty high but it's the moon <coughs> um, and we ended up uh, where did we end up? 40 meters away in the x direction from where we were. Now that's not necessarily very accurate. So what if we, if we made dt a lot smaller and instead of having to click every time I'm going to comment this line out. This is a useful, whoops, not that line. That's an important line. I'm going to, I'm inside the loop instead of a pause I'm going to put a rate 100 uh, maybe even 200 so that I don't have to click every time it goes because now I'm taking a lot of steps and they're really small and now if I run it um, we get lots and lots of numbers and we've gone 40 meters and the height was what was the maximum height here well 40 44 point 
Okay, so 44.9 something looks like. Now there's a, that's sort of tedious. There's kind of a cute way to get it to tell us what the maximum height was. <coughs> if we say, I'm going to call a variable y max and set it to zero. <coughs> and then inside the loop, um, I'm going to say if ball dot position dot y is greater than y max, which it will be right to start row, uh, y max is ball dot position dot y. So every time we go through, as it's going up, it's going to replace y max with the current y position until it starts to go down again, and then it's not going to do that anymore. And so we'll actually know this at the end. And And if we take this print statement out of the loop by commenting it out, this isn't, so it's, that's not what I wanted to do. I want to comment out this print statement. It's a lot faster when I don't print. So it now tells me that the maximum y was that we got was 44.94, and if we wanted a more accurate value, we could make dt even smaller. Okay, so this is a very general approach. It doesn't. It works with any kind of forces, um, not just not just constant forces. So questions about this? Yes? Could you find a general equation for its position related to time? That's a very good question. So the question is, can we find a general equation for its position related to time? And the answer is, in this particular case, yes, because the force is constant. In cases where the force is not constant, usually not. <laughs> So usually we really will have to do this. Um, in this particular case, because the force is constant, we can't actually solve it algebraically and get a general, general equation for position related to time. And in fact, let's just do that. So for a constant force, we'll do this in one dimension. So we'll, we'll do this for the y component here. But, but we, could sub, we could substitute x for y or z for y. It doesn't matter what direction we're doing this in. This is, so this is called, when we have a general equation for something, we come out with a, something as a function of something. That's called an analytical solution or an algebraic solution. So what we're going to look for is an analytical <coughs> solution <coughs> constant <coughs> force. <coughs> So we start it the same way. We say, and let's just do it in the y dimension. So we say py final is py initial plus f net y delta t. So we're taking one of those three equations that, that come out of our <coughs> 
momentum principle there. <coughs> and so if we just divide by mass, we get Vy final is Vy initial plus F net Y over the mass times delta T. <coughs> And that actually is already an analytical expression for the y component of velocity here. Because if we start t initial at 0, then delta t is going to be whatever time it is now minus 0. And it's just going to be t. So we can rewrite this as v y at time t is equal to v y initial plus f net y divided by the mass times t. So we have the y component when, when the force is constant. We know the y component of velocity is if the force was constant in the x direction and in lab you will do some experiments with a a cart, low friction cart with a fan mounted on it. And when the fan's turned on, the force of the air on the system of fan plus cart is nearly constant. So you'll be able to, to watch the motion and we have a nice computer interface that'll make graphs of what, x versus t or, and vx versus t for you. So, so we'll experiment with with con motion with constant forces in the x direction in lab. <coughs> um, okay, but we need position, right? <coughs> so to get position, we actually need uh, an average velocity because our equation in this one dimension is going to be y final is y initial plus v average y times delta t. <coughs> and so in this particular case, because we know the force is constant, for the average velocity, we actually really can average the initial and final velocity across the interval, just take the arithmetic average. <coughs> so in this special case, So V average Y is equal to V um, Y initial plus V Y final divided by two. But we have an equation for V Y final. <coughs> So that's going to be equal to Vy initial plus another Vy initial plus F net in the Y direction over the mass times T. This whole thing divided by 2. And just simplifying the algebra, we're going to get uh, v y initial plus a half uh, times f net y over m times t. So now we can go back here. We can say y final is y initial plus this whole thing, v uh, y initial plus a half. F net 
y over m times t, and that whole thing is going to be multiplied by delta t, and remember we're going to replace delta t by t because we're starting at zero. <coughs> and so we end up with an equation y final is the initial position plus the initial uh, velocity in the y direction times t plus a half times this quantity, the net force over the mass, times <coughs> t squared. <coughs> and so we could write this as, this is basically the, the final position as a function of t. <coughs> So we have these equations. Um, they're not very general because they only work for constant force. And if we have a spring attached to something, the force isn't constant. If we have something orbiting the Earth, the force isn't constant. If we have things interacting with electric forces, the force depends on distance. So most of the interesting forces aren't constant, but when we know that the force is constant, we can indeed use these equations. Um, so they're not worth memorizing, though. Um, but... This... This is absolutely worth memorizing. This is not. Um, for constant f, um, we have v y final is v y initial plus f net y over m times t and we have y final is equal to y initial plus v y initial times t plus a half net force divided by the mass t squared Let's see what we can do with these equations. There actually are kind of a lot of uh, problems we can solve, although it's typically more effortful to do it this way than it is to write a computational model, but we should know how to do it. <coughs> what? Memorize that. <laughs> you don't need to memorize those other equations. Yes. Well, we remember we were doing it in one dimension, so we're talking about the y component. So this would be this would be true for for um, so for the x component too. We could have uh, v x final is v x initial plus <coughs> f net over m the x component of f net over m times t and x final is x initial plus all that stuff. Uh, v x initial times 
t plus a half the x component of the net force t squared and things if the force was in the constant force was in the x direction if there is no force in the other directions then we just go back to using the velocity to update the position velocity is not changing right or this could be z so so it's it's all the components so r remember r is x y z and we saw in our little program here let's put the print back in um, okay let's make let's make dt something small again let's uh, well that's okay um, we'll print everything again okay so here's our so here is the momentum has x y and z components since the force was in the y direction only the y component of momentum was changing right and the position well both components x and y were both changing um, but the x component was just changing linearly because the momentum and hence the, the x component of the momentum and velocity wasn't changing so that just increased linearly but the y component increased and then decreased because of the force acting on it so so if we had a constant force in every direction we'd have to solve all of those equations but if we have a constant force in the y direction and force is zero in the x direction then the, the x equation <coughs> ends up being very simple because that um, because that's zero and it's just we're just adding v times t delta t to it does that make sense other questions so let's see what kinds of uh, of problems we can solve using these equations so we'll go back to our our ball on the moon so G is 1.6 newtons per kilogram the mass is 1.25 kilograms <clears throat> the initial velocity was 12 12 0 meters per second <clears throat> So how high does the ball go? What's its maximum height? So we got that on the program because we, we looked at the numbers and then we actually asked it to to keep track of the maximum height for us and print it out. It came out to about close to 45 meters, right? Now, how do we use these equations to get that? There's no maximum height in here. Yeah. Wait. Yeah, we have to do something really indirect. So you're right. We have to say, and I bet you've seen a problem like this before, but um, we have to say at the top, so suppose we threw a ball just straight up. So the y component of its velocity is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and momentarily at the top, it's zero. And then it gets bigger and bigger in the minus y direction, right? <clears throat> 
know that the that at the top the y component of velocity is zero. Um, and that isn't going to tell us the height, but what would it tell us? What can we get from that? How long it takes to get up there. So we get the time to reach the top. And once we know the time to reach the top, we can just find the position at the top. Okay, so let's do this. So we have, we'll use this equation, zero, vy final is zero, plus our initial y component of velocity was 12 meters per second. And that's plus the y component of the force. <coughs> you may remember was zero, negative two, zero newtons. So we have negative two newtons divided by 1.25 kilograms times T. And we can solve that for T. And that actually comes out to 7.5 seconds if you solve it. And we found that it was between 7 and 8 seconds that the, the ball reached the top of its trajectory, right? Um, and now we know that, we can say y final. So y, we've chosen the final. When we say final and initial, we get to pick final and initial always. There's not like some arbitrary thing. So we're picking the final time is when the ball is at the top. And so y final is um, the initial height, which was zero, plus Vy initial times T, so 12 meters per second times 7.5 seconds, plus a half times negative 2 newtons divided by 1.25 kilograms times 7.5 seconds squared. <coughs> and if you work this out, it comes out to 45 meters. We were getting, with our finite delta t's, we were getting about 49.9 or something, so pretty good. <coughs> So how useful is this? And can we figure out how far it goes? How far does it go? How, when it, so what's, what's that distance? So we need, yeah, we need x final is x initial, which is negative 140 plus Vx, which doesn't change, so 12 meters per second, but what's T? It's going to be twice as long as it took it to get to the top, right? So times... Okay, so, so solve, we can solve problems this way. It, it, it requires several steps and it's a little indirect and you have to actually <coughs> Think about some things that, that, that just are not immediately obvious, like, oh, I know that at the top 
the y component of its velocity is zero, so if I knew how long it took it to get there, then I could figure out how, where it was. So that's, that's moderately indirect, so not, not trivial. So let's look at, um, a, yes, uh, there we go. Okay, so this is a program that calculates the, the trajectory of a, of a baseball, hit it. with and without air resistance. So this, the reason that, so the reason we did this on the moon is because we didn't want to deal with air resistance. Why don't we don't, don't want to deal with air resistance? Because the force of, the, the magnitude of the air resistance depends on the speed. So it's changing as the ball's speed decreases, air resistance decreases, and its direction is always changing too because it's opposite to the direction of the ball's motion. So that's easy to do computationally hard almost impossible to do this way. <coughs> so here's a program that models the motion of this ball with air resistance. So the gravitational force is down, the air resistance force is that cyan arrow, and the magenta arrow is the, the net force. So now, now that we know what those are, let's run it again. <coughs> So the red, red arrow pointing down is gravitational force. The cyan arrow is air resistance. You can see its magnitude and direction change. And the magenta arrow is the net force. So as the ball slows down, air resistance decreases. And then as it starts to speed up again, it gets a little bigger. So the air resistance forces, we're having to calculate every single time. What would we get if we use these equations? So let's take air resistance out of that. So the only force we've got is the gravitational force. Wow, that's a really different trajectory. <coughs> In fact, it goes twice as far. So if we, if we were going to use these, try to use these equations for constant force to model the trajectory of something going even 100 miles an hour like that, we'd be off by at least a factor of two. <laughs> so, <coughs> Um, it sometimes in the real world could be useful. Uh, mostly, you're going to want a more sophisticated model. And we'll see that we can add in forces like the air resistance force quite easily once we understand how the forces work. <coughs> Questions? <coughs> All right, so what we're going to do in recitation today is um, we're going to practice uh, using, working some problems involving the momentum principle that involve really big forces acting over short times. So one step, but, but not, not trivial, collisions, basically. And rather than start something new, we can just go ahead and have our quiz. <coughs> How about that? For this quiz, you uh, do not need a calculator. You, um, you want something to write with. You don't, you can't use your notes. 